In this tutorial, we're going to be discussing X-ray beam filters, in particular combination filters like the Thiraeus filter. This discussion has much more examination and historical relevance than it does of the practical kind, so I suggest that if this isn't specifically on your training syllabus that you ignore this tutorial and move on to the next one. Low energy photon beams deposit the majority of their dose at the skin surface, and high doses to the skin can cause nasty side effects like radiation burns. So if we want to reduce dose to the skin while treating a tumor that's deeper than the skin surface, we need to bump up the beam energy. One method of doing this is to use a higher voltage to generate the x-ray beam. But in the era before megavoltage treatment machines, we were limited to about 500 kilo electron volt beam energies. So in order to increase the beam energy, we relied a lot more on beam filtration. But beam filtration increases the average beam energy at the expense of the dose rate. Because you're cutting more photons out of your beam, which means that fewer will reach the patient and deposit dose. So extreme beam filtration can result in treatment times that are impractically long. One way to get around this is to use combination filters, which allow us to increase our beam energy with a minimal loss in dose rate. As the low energy components of a photon beam energy spectrum that tend to interact near the skin surface and deliver dose to the skin. If we want to reduce skin dose via filtration, we need to knock out this low energy end of the spectrum, ideally obtaining a spectrum that looks something like this. In order to increase our beam's average energy in the most efficient manner possible, we take advantage of a few facts about the photoelectric effect that I haven't mentioned already because they're only relevant to this discussion. If we look at a graph of the likelihood of photoelectric interaction versus energy, we see that it has these little peaks, followed by sharp drop-offs. This implies that photons are more likely to undergo the photoelectric interaction within certain bands of energy. These are called absorption edges. The reason that we see these peaks is because the photoelectric interaction is more likely to happen when the photon energy is close to, but slightly higher than, the binding energy of an electron orbital. It needs to be higher than this energy because otherwise the photon doesn't have enough energy to free the electron from its orbital and the photoelectric effect can't occur. These peaks actually correspond to the binding energies of each of the orbitals surrounding this atom. As atomic number increases, so does the number of protons inside the nucleus, and therefore the attraction between it and its surrounding electrons. This results in an increased binding energy, so that increases the energy at which these absorption edges occur. So this means that higher atomic number atoms are better able to absorb higher energy photons via the photoelectric effect. Characteristic X-ray emission is also relevant here. So a quick review, each atomic orbital has an associated energy, so an energy that an electron has to have in order to inhabit it. The energy level tends to be lower closer to the nucleus and higher further away. Electrons prefer to be closer to the nucleus, so if a gap opens up in an inner orbital, one from an outer orbital will drop down to fill it. But because electrons have to have a particular energy when occupying a particular orbital, the electron must change energy in order to change orbital, which during characteristic X-ray emission, it emits as an X-ray photon. So this photon energy is equal to the difference between the energy of the orbital that the electron is moving from and the orbital that it's moving to. The energy of the orbital surrounding a nucleus depends on the number of protons within the nucleus, so therefore on the atomic number. So each element will have different energies associated with those electron orbitals. So this means that each element will also have its own specific differences between these energy levels, and therefore its own specific set of X-ray energies that can be emitted when electrons transition from one to the other. It's a characteristic of each element, hence the name characteristic X-rays. Higher atomic number elements tend to have a greater range of allowed transitions, and therefore are able to produce higher energy characteristic X-rays. We can harness the information on the previous two slides in order to optimize our beam filters to produce maximal beam hardening with minimal dose rate reduction. I mentioned that each atom is better at absorbing photons via the photoelectric effect within a specific energy range. I also mentioned that each atom produces characteristic X-rays within a specific energy range as well. This tends to be slightly lower than the energies at which absorption is increased. Both of these effects occur at higher energies as the atomic number increases. This isn't the most accurate depiction of the effect of these two processes on the beam energy spectrum, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is that within the range of increased absorption, which we call an absorption edge, the number of photons has been decreased. Now, it will be decreased everywhere, but more so in this part of the spectrum. And at a slightly lower energy due to characteristic X-ray emission, the number of photons hasn't been decreased as much. So the lower energy end of the spectrum will still be filtered out to a certain degree, but it's added to somewhat as well by the characteristic X-ray emissions within the filter. If we were to pass this beam through a slightly lower atomic number filter instead, we'd see that this absorption edge occurs at a lower energy, and that the characteristic X-ray emission occurs at a lower energy too. This is the basis of combination filters, passing the characteristic X-ray emissions of a high atomic number filter material through the absorption edge of a lower atomic number material below. We produce X-ray beams by slamming electrons into a target material usually tungsten, which converts the electron's energy into photons. 
This produces X-rays with a maximum energy of the same energy as the electrons that enter the target, so the KVP, or peak kilovoltage, plus a characteristic X-ray component, which we mentioned on the previous slide, which for tungsten is about 60 kiloelectron volts and below. If you're treating with a beam of around about 100 kV, that's not such a bad thing. But if you want to treat with a much higher energy and minimize low energy components of your beam, you need to get rid of this. So if you want to get rid of this characteristic X-ray component and any non-characteristic X-rays of this energy within your beam in order to increase the beam's average energy, you can pass it through a material that has an absorption edge of around about this energy. In this case, a good choice would be tin, which has an absorption edge from 30 to 70 kV, so it would eat up a lot of those 60 kV photons. This would cut out a lot of photons from this part of the spectrum here. It would also emit characteristic X-rays of energies of less than around about 30 kV, which would soften the beam. So if we want to cut out this extra low energy component, we can pass it through copper, which has an absorption edge of around about these energies as well. The copper will also in turn emit its own low energy characteristic X-rays, in this case less than about 20 kV, which will soften our beam. So we can cut these out by passing the beam through another layer of aluminium, which preferentially absorbs extremely low energy photons from the range of 1.5 to around about 9 kiloelectron volts, and emits characteristic X-rays of an extremely tiny energy. So you notice that we're passing the beam through materials of successively lower atomic number in order to move that absorption edge and that characteristic X-ray emission lower and lower. This sort of filtration is only really worth doing if you're attempting to generate a high beam energy, so if you're trying to treat a deep structure. If you're treating something more superficial, it's often beneficial to use a lower beam energy in order to avoid underlying structures. The effect that we're trying to go for with this combination approach is to cut out a specific portion of the beam energy spectrum. This has the effect of contributing to the portion directly below the bit you're cutting out. So you add another layer to your filter which cuts out this portion that was added and contributes some more that's a slightly lower energy. So you add another layer which cuts this out too until the energy that's emitted by the filter layer is negligible. Bear in mind that this whole time you're also attenuating the higher energy beam components too, just to a lesser degree than the lower energy. This three layer filter of tin, copper and aluminium is called a Thoreus filter. It allows you to get the same degree of beam hardening as a copper filter, but with a 25 to 30 percent higher dose rate. This pops up quite frequently on training syllabi, but I'm a bit confused as to why, since this is all aimed at making the best of available technology, probably in the pre-1950s era. Now if you want to treat a deeper structure and spare the skin, I can't actually see why you'd want to use an ultra voltage unit with a Thoreus filter instead of a linear accelerator.